Good morning, everybody. This is QAH bringing you another video. We are reacting to the Genshin Impact, not teaser, we already did that. Go check out the other video. We're going to check out the history of the Vatui because I only know Tartalia and I'm just getting to know everybody else. So, this will be a great time to catch up on a little quick history right along with my morning breakfast that I made, eggs and waffles. Yes, this will be a mook mook. In my nice hair voice, we are eating. <laughs> Hope you like the bun. Made by me. Thank you. Not a hairstylist. And also, please, one thing, please be sure to hit the like, comment, share, subscribe button, and turn on the bell. Second, this is a reminder, this is not a reaction channel, this is a gaming channel. So please do not put recommendations of what to react to in the comments unless it's Genshin Impact related or slash gaming related. I will have an additional reaction channel coming very soon that's about music videos, maybe a little bit of reviews, woo woo woo, this that and the third. Cool. Cool. Had to get that out of the way. My food is getting cold. <laughs> Also, are you having a good day whenever you're watching this? I hope so. The quality is always like on one FF, like Android quality, microwave recording. A link to the original video will be in the description below. If it ever loads. My food is gonna go. Introducing the much anticipated, the incredibly mysterious, the overly hostile, and day celestial force we all love to hate, the Fatui Harbingers! In reverse order, we have Tartalia, Sandrone, Pantalone, Senora, Arlecchino, Scaramouche, Puccinella, Dottore, Columbia. La Senora and Scaramouche is part of the tribe? Can't wait for them, uh, for those background stories. Nina Capitano and the big daddy of them all, Piero. Okay, so the order is partly speculative, as are all these constellations, because we're missing official ranks for numbers 10, 7, 4, and 2, but I'll explain my reasoning on their placement a little bit later in this video. Now, I have changed my opinion on a few things since my last prediction video, because Child decided to outright tell us that the Harbingers are ranked by strength. Hey, uh, future Ash guy here. As it turns out, Child's talk of strength does not indicate raw combat power in Chinese. It's difficult to explain the nuances of it, but basically the reference does not only include combat power, but also overall value and utility. For example, Puccinella is ranked number 5 and may be weaker in combat versus someone at rank 10, but may bring more power and versatility to the table as a government official, which would give him an overall higher rank. This nuance makes rankings incredibly difficult to gauge accurately just because we don't know enough about each Harbinger. Now that said, in my last predictions video, I ranked all the Harbingers based on biblical numerology, and interestingly, that method still works here even though some of the ranks get shuffled around a bit from my last round. I will leave a link to that video if you want to learn more about that, but just know that my ranks are a little bit different from video to video, and that's okay, there's different reasoning. Just note that all of the rank predictions in this video in particular were written before I was aware of the subtleties in the language used in the original Chinese. Okay, back to past me. Anyway, let's go ahead and get to know each Harbinger in this speculated order. I am skipping Tartalia because we know basically everything about him already, and Scaramouche because I'll be lumping him in with the Gnosis, and Piero because he requires a much deeper dive. He's a very special boy. And grab a snack and get comfy, guys. The introductions start now. We know next to nothing about Sandrone officially. Also, I want to make this clear as well. Do not put link information in the comments. You will be blocked. Just want to make that clear. This is We know next to nothing about Sandrone officially. This is not only her first appearance in this teaser, but this teaser is basically all the information we have to go on, so I can't provide all that much for you. But what I can tell you is that the original... 
original Sin drone from the Comedia was actually a character adopted from a traditional puppet show, which is where all this marionette imagery comes from. Originally, Sin drone was a male puppet, but he did have a puppet wife. So looking at... You know what's funny? When I first seen... Sorry, I'm, I'm chewing. What was funny about this, when I first looked at her, I did say, well, as I was discussing it with my cousin, I did mistakenly say Maria Antoinette. And then I tried to pronounce Marie T. Marie, Marie and T. Cute name, though. Harbinger sand drone coming in as a pair, I'm not actually sure immediately which one is the true Harbinger. It could be the sentient robot that makes pretty humanoid doll androids, or it could be a pretty girl who likes to make fancy robots. I could argue either case, honestly. For now, I'm going to assume it's the pretty girl who makes fancy robots, because that seems more Hoyo versus style. Now, I originally ranked her at number 7, but I'm moving her to number 10 for a couple of reasons. First, I think without a robot, she might actually be kind of weak, so a lower rank makes sense. And second, well, I did say I wouldn't talk about biblical numerology here, but I have to mention the number 10 can symbolize the whole world being connected or unified, which is relevant to why I shifted her rank in the first place, so I guess I'm mentioning it. See, while Sandro's most striking feature is her super fancy Ruin Guard, which is kind of odd because the last Ruin Guard lab we saw actually belonged to Dettori and not Sandrone, but whatever. The most interesting thing about her is how much she looks like Catherine. Her skilled Catherine. Now, if you've ever been to one of my streams, you've probably heard my whole theory about how all the Catherines are just robots being puppeted by a remote operator somewhere. They say error and rebooting all the time, and the Adventurer's Guild is actually head- For real! I'll be like, what are they talking about? Talking about error. You just be sitting up in Izuma trying to figure out what- or, um- uh, Monster Izuma, wherever you at in the region, trying to figure out what to do in the game. They be in the background. Era. Rebooting. You just be like. Oh, okay. Do what you gotta do. I'm trying to figure out what to do in this game. You know what? That's it. Headquartered in Shineshnaya. And look at all these little subtle similarities between the two. They've got a similar haircut, the bonnet, the way the bust line is cut, the style of dress, the collar, the crossed hands. It's actually very possible that Sandrone is operating the Adventurer's Guild. That would make her an intelligence agent, and she therefore wouldn't need to be all that strong herself, you know? That also makes Sandrone, aka Marionette, number 10 of the Fatui Harbingers with the Marionette as her constellation. I'm just going to say it because we're all thinking it. Pantalone has massive Baiju vibes. And I regret to inform you that there's actually more to this theory than just their looks. Like, okay, yes, Baiju and Pantalone have similar glasses, hair, speech patterns, and sussy sussy little smiles, but it's also possible that they are both from Liwa. This is because Pantalone... When I first seen the things, I was like, Baiju? When the hell did you turn evil? <laughs> You look good, but it's like, what you doing here? Pantalone's backstory parallels Ningguang's. Both of them grew up extremely poor, only to become extremely wealthy later on. The difference is Ningguang really loves Mora, truly, and loves earning it. And according to the Pale Flame set, Pantalone kind of resents it, even though he lusts after it. He sees control of the financial sector, not because he likes money necessarily, but because he sees it as the heart that beats around the world, and his goal is to force that heart to stop beating by his will alone. He also runs the Northland Bank, so Pantalone could be easily linked back to Liyue just because he has so many fingers in that pie, like a suspicious amount. And here's the thing. The constellation that I'm pretty sure belongs to him is the open palm with a spiral. This, as far as I can tell, is a Native American symbol from the Hopi tribe known as the Healing Hand, and it also may be a reference to Jainism's Ahimsa Hand, which is from India, which represented a vow of non-violence. But the constellation itself has detached fingers, which make it look a bit more like a handprint. And you'd get the biggest gaps between the palm and the fingers if you were wearing a lot of rings, which Pantalone is, on his left hand. 
If this is not a handprint, then his constellation would actually be depicting his right hand, upon which he is only wearing one ring on his ring finger, and lo and behold, the one finger on the constellation that differs from the other is the ring finger. Now, in some Eastern religions, men wear their This right now is exceptional because I never noticed no stuff like this when looking at the taser. I'm just so focused on how good they look. And how evil Tartalia is. That's a whole nother theory. Videos coming soon of my breakdown. Insane. The story. Their wedding rings on their right hand, which would line up here. And guess what? Baiju and Changsheng, his snake, are based on the myth of the immortal white snake, wherein a white snake demon took human form and married a pharmacist. Which means that Changsheng could be Baiju's waifu. That would also mean that Pantalone is married, which doesn't really quite seem like, you know, Hoyo versus style, but whatever. It is. Okay, I'm, I'm not running with that theory. I was thinking more like twin brothers. One is kind of like evil, vindictive, unpredictable, which we see in the teaser. The Hoya versus dropped. And then we see Baizu, you know, kind of good guy from Dentro as well. You know, obviously we can see his vision. You know, he presents himself in a more humble type of manner than his twin brother. That's what I was getting. Or Bazu could have an evil side, his ego, and could be working for the Fatui because it's a rare occasion we see him. But that's just my theory. It's suspicious, in addition to this, that he's referenced in Yelan's story quest, though. Especially if he has a connection to Baiju, because Yelan frequents the pharmacy, but only does so in a lot of different disguises. Can you imagine these two interacting regularly, both under different aliases and different disguises? It's hysterical. Absolutely hysterical. But the, the, the problem with this is that Arlequino basically says straight up that Pantalone doesn't leave Shneshnaya very often, so Baizu being a disguise of his wouldn't really work unless Baizu is some kind of avatar that gets piloted remotely and is overseen by Changsheng. That would explain why everyone says he's sick, even though he doesn't show any symptoms, and why he's not around the pharmacy all that often, and why his most trusted companion is a conveniently forgetful zombie, and why Zhongli doesn't really recognize him, even though that guy remembers everything, and also why Baiju isn't playable yet, or even in, like, the forecast for the playable future. Like, what, what? Well, 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 well he, he's not playable because he has a whole different vision, Dentro. That's why he's not playable yet, even though, I mean, yeah, we see him often, as well as the Amiko, which her design was very Russian, she needs above, how in the world Ayuto gets above way before her, but that's a whole nother rant for a whole different day. But Baizu is not playable because he has a whole different vision, he's not Amino, he's not Pyro, he's not Hydro, he's not Geo, he's, he has Dentro, he has the very last element. But I do, I do agree with her up to now. But, you know, even even then, Pantalone does not have a vision. So if this does end up being true, then Baiju's vision will actually be fake or maybe a disguised illusion. It's complicated. And okay, sure, one of Pantalone's rings looks a bit like this constellation instead, the heresy symbol, but Comedia's Pantalone and Dottore are actually very closely linked to each other, sometimes even alter egos of each other. So I'm not going to use this as evidence to suggest that this is Pantalone's constellation when I think it's Dottore's. Instead, I would like to propose that these two are actually quite close to each other. So that's my take on Pantalone, aka Regrater, the ninth of the Fatui Harbingers in charge of I'm like seven. Well, when you're seeing this, it looks like I'm 18 minutes in. I'm like 17, 17, seven, almost seven to eight minutes in. I'm finna subscribe because, girl, the way your mind works, how you break down this stuff, it's just like I never would have got any of this from looking at the teaser. Like, like knowing all of this. Probably knowing the history, the relationship, but like the little details from the rings, from the lookalikes, well, the, 
the lookalikes was kind of obvious, but the reins and the orientation of it, you would have never expected that when first looking at the teaser. No matter how many times you watch it, you would never think to like look at the little details, the history behind it, that the analysis. You would just be like, "Flabbergasted." Ask me. of Economic Policies, owner of the Open Hand Constellation. Okay, we good, because I just got a notification. I, I hate that when I'm recording, something comes up, like a notification, or this, that, and the third stops it. Whatever kind of notifications I get, it stops the recording and it's a pain in my gut when I have to edit all of this and sync in the audio so I'm gonna just shut up let it rock we're good so Senora is actually dead like, dead, dead. Like, I'm not even really on the hopium she might come back as Rosalind Train anymore. She's pretty, pretty dead. Deader than I thought she was. She could stay dead for all I care because the way she treated Vinci, ain't no coming back from that. No, seriously, ain't no coming back for that because she, okay. Piero even straight up says that wherever the Fatui are going, Rosalind is not going to be there with them. So, uh... And I have no idea what's in that coffin since she was, like, vaporized. But what's really interesting about this is that her coffin has a lot of similarities with the unified civilization's architecture. So, like, Enconomia and the buildings in the chasm. And it's not just the coffin that has similar architecture. And that has some really neat implications that we'll kind of talk Hold on, even first glance looking at it, I never noticed it was even a casket. I thought it was a table. about a little bit later but not a whole lot just it's a neat observation i guess i don't know if i really need to explain her backstory do i by now everyone should know that she was a citizen of mondstadt 500 years ago who studied in the sumeru academia and then turned herself into the crimson witch of flames out of rage and grief when her lover rostam died in the cataclysm i mean she was recruited after that and then she stole two gnosis and got vaporized by the shogun that's basically the whole story she is now very dead so, uh, pour one out for La Senora, a.k.a. the Fair Lady, number eight of the Fatui Harbingers, a diplomat of sh so, I'm gonna save my drinks, save my juice, cause that girl is not worth pouring up for. Nashnaya and the Moth Constellation. Ah, yes. Arlequino, Twitter's new darling. Arlequino runs the House of Hearth Orphanage in Shneshnaya, where she raises and trains orphans to be outstanding soldiers of the Fatui. Basically, everything we know about her comes from this quest with Gendo Ringo, who, uh, well, I won't actually spoil it for you. If you go to this place in Inazuma, you can trigger the quest and explore it for yourself. I highly recommend it, but just know that it's like literally time-gated and it takes a few days. Her title, the Knave, is a term usually reserved for young male servants or young androgynous servants, or it could be another name for the Jack and a deck of playing cards. Of the three face cards within a normal deck, the Jack is always the lowest rank within the royal court. Now, I do concede that this would usually put her around rank four, I guess, but her competition for the rank is with Dottori and Capitano, and I struggle to see her being stronger than either of them, honestly. Besides, she addresses both Pantalona and Puccinella, numbers 9 and 5 respectively, in such a way that makes me think her rank would sit in between them, and the only open number there is 7. I did originally rank her at number 2 in a previous video because in the Commedia, Arlecchino and Piero are generally equals, so rank 2 just made sense. But I started to realize that while the physical traits of the Harbingers are pretty faithful to the Commedia, their personality quirks are kind of contrary. I already mentioned one instance of this with Pantalone, who in the Commedia loves and adores money while Harbinger Pantalone seems to love it on the surface but actually kind of resents it. Another example is Tartaglia, who in the Commedia is an old man who's a bit slow and talks with a stutter, while the Harbinger Tartaglia is the youngest of the lot, outgoing and silver-tongued. 
This makes me think that something similar is going on with Arlecchino and that she may not actually consider Piero a rival or an equal at all. It would therefore not make sense for her to be his near equal in strength at number two. I'm far more confident about her constellation than her rank, though. After my last video, it was brought to my attention that the clawed hand is actually called a hand of glory, which is uh, kind of gross, actually. It was a severed hand. She's also part of the Illuminati. No wonder why she's so good. Mm. Hand of a dead man, thief, or other criminal that was either turned into a candle or a candle holder, hence the flame. Since Child has suggested that she'd easily betray the Fatui to suit her own needs, this feels like it kind of suits her. It's got that traitor vibe to it, you know? It could theoretically work for Capitano, but he has too many honor and pride and all that kind of stuff vibes going on, so I don't think it's his. Therefore, I think Arlecchino, aka the Knave, is number seven of the Fatui Harbingers and the head of the House of Hearth Orphanage and the Hand of Glory constellation. This was not at all what I expected for Puccinella. First off, this is the same guy in the Travail trailer. You'd never know it, but that shot was just a really flattering low angle. Second, this dude has elf ears, like Klee. That makes him the fourth elf-eared character in the game, and all of them have white hair. It's funny, I have Klee as one of my favorite characters. Like, wallpapers, actually two to three. She's kind of blended in with Jean as well, and on her own. If you got the Naval desktop app, you'll know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but I never noticed Klee's ears. It's so well blended with her hair, I had to swallow, that I did not realize that. I compared this suit to Mr. Monopoly, then Klee. Mm, we really getting into some things. Hair and they're small and no, I didn't miscount. There are actually four. I'm just not allowed to talk about number three yet. The other two are obviously Klee and Janssen. I have no idea what it means, but I am so bothered by the existence of these ears. Like, what if he's actually related to Klee? Like, maybe not directly, but Alice did say they were from a long-lived race, so what if Puccinella is another one of their race? What if he knows Alice? That's such a... I don't know what to say about that. Also, this symbol on his hat really bothers me because it looks so much like a Hillichurl mask. I mean, look at it. W what are the implications of that? I don't even know. Brainworms aside, though, something neat I noticed is that his hat is not only full of feathers, but the brim is kind of structured like a pair of wings. And this is super cool because his title is The Rooster, and it also suits his bonafide beak of a nose. Like, Jesus, look at that thing. Uh, Puccinella, however, is a government official. The others call him mayor, which I, in my opinion is kind of a weird choice of words since mayors only really govern towns as far as I know. But Child describes him as a really good guy who he likes a lot, and he takes care of his family while he's away, but like, I don't know about anybody else, but I get like massive Godfather vibes from Puccinella. Like he'll be nice to you on the surface, treat you like family, but if you say so much as one bad thing against him, you'll have gone against the family, you know? Guys like that use innocent people as leverage against their subordinates. If Puccinella is close to Child's family, then he's basically got Child on a leash. He's got leverage, and he was the one who even selected him to join the Harbingers in the first place. I find that worrisome. As for my choice of his constellation, I will concede that he could be this symbol. Now, I called it the heresy symbol, and I assigned it to Dottore, but I will admit that it could also be a Globus Cruciger, which is a symbol of authority, and the mask could be a Plague Doctor's mask, but, like, that's so obvious and boring. Dottore is a doctor, so let's give him a Plague Doctor mask. Ugh. However, I still think Puccinella is actually the Plague Doctor mask. And the reason is... He actually looks like a plague doctor, like straight up. It's the round glasses, it's the long nose, it's the right shape. He's even got the same hat, man. Like, it's the same thing. And just for the record, most plague doctors were not doctors. Or at least not like really trained physicians. They were either new physicians or just any person who decided that they wanted to participate in treating people, like a volunteer, but they actually got paid. But the thing about plague doctors is they did treat people regardless of their income. And I actually think that that suits Puccinella because Puccinella is described by child as actually being pretty generous. 
a fair and just politician that wants to earn the favor of the people, like he would, would effectively treat everyone equally regardless of status. So I think this still fits. I am sticking with it. He's the Plague Doctor mask. Also, if I might just add this, the Plague Doctor mask actually does look a lot like Puccinella's Commedia mask with the long, elongated beak kind of thing. So there's also that. Anyway, that's my take on Puccinella, a.k.a. the rooster. He's the mayor of Shneshnaya, I guess. And the number five of the Fatui Harbingers with the Plague Doctor mask constellation. I'm sticking with it. This may surprise you. But there is more than one Dottore. In fact, I can count at least four that we've met so far. Now, according to Child, Dottore took snapshots of himself at different stages in life and then created new bodies based off of each one and gave them different responsibilities and assignments. The oldest Dottore, who I will call Dottore Prime, is this one. While a slightly younger version... I was going to say that she kind of looked familiar. I was like, Iso? Are you a Dottore? Hmm? Did you tell your sister I could this? Hmm? Supposed to be the man of the people. Hmm. But that's a conspiracy. Don't run with it. Virgin is the one attending Senora's memorial. Note that this is an assumption that I'm making because the exact wording was the La Senora had a memorial? Oh. I paid her memory of dust. Hmm segment in the prime of his life, which is kind of subjective about what age that is. Dottori himself seems to favor being older compared to being younger, though, so a prime age to him seems like it would be the oldest, in my opinion. But Columbina does call it a segment, so honestly, it could go either way, but it's one of these two. Now, I think there are two different Dottoris in the manga. Both are much younger and more unhinged than Dottori Prime. There's this one that attends Diluc's banquet, and then there's this one Sorry to keep pausing, but where are y'all finding these mangas? Genshin anti manga? Anybody know? Let me know. Cause I'm re I wanna read. I ain't got nothing else to do. One that presumably stayed in Heresies, which would be his lab kind of fatui based thing. It would explain the differences in their attitude towards Dulug's delusion. One of them really wanted to study it, and the other one kind of just thought it was trash. Now, granted, the delusion was broken at that point, but still, studying a broken delusion is probably still worth something, right? Anyway, Dottori isn't actually a medical doctor. The Pale Flame set is very, very clear about that, but he did study at Sumeru Academia, which might make him more like someone studying for their doctorate degree, or his name could just be ironic like it says in the Pale Flame set, it could be both. Dottori kind of thinks of humans as machines, and he may even be mostly machinery himself, and that's an ideal that earned him the title of heretic during his time at the Academia. He was later violently chased out of his hometown by an angry mob with pitchforks, and upon recruitment, Dottori offered to create anything Piero wanted, even a god, because he thinks of them as something you can just assemble, right? And offering some mysterious guy who just comes along and says, hey, you want to work for me? He's like, yeah, I'll build you a god. That, that's a bit ominous, and it's also the reason why most believe that Dottori is responsible for unlocking Scaramouche's sealed capabilities, having been a divine puppet. The opportunity to tinker with a body created by a god would have been too perfect an opportunity to pass up. In fact, the whole situation in Inazuma may have been part of a plan that Dottori fabricated in the interest of researching the exact methods behind the fabrication of a godlike entity and what it would actually take to use the Gnosis properly. We'll talk about that a little bit more later, but it's, uh, it, it's kind of terrifying when you think about it. I'm sticking with my original ranking of number four because I don't think he's the strongest after Piero, but I do think he's stronger than most of the Harbingers. I'm sticking with my original prediction for his constellation as well. I really do think this is a heresy symbol. I got a lot of questions last time about where the heresy symbol actually came from, and after a lot of digging, I found out that it's actually a twisted interpretation of the Secret Heart of Christ. Its association with heresy has its roots in the teachings of Jansenism, as far as I can tell, but for the proper reasoning, rationale, and history, I'm just going to let you guys research that on your own. But since Dottore Prime was busy with a little experiment in blasphemy, I'm really inclined to attribute heresy to Dottore as well. Blasphemy and heresy are indeed different, but they are also quite similar. Plus, he's literally called a heretic in the Pale Flame set, and he was even put on trial for heresy! That's when Piero actually recruited him, like right after his trial. 
It would be absolutely insane if his constellation isn't also the symbol for heresy. Like, like baffling, mind-boggling. I, 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 I don't know what I would do. But that just means that I think Dottore, a.k.a. the Doctor, is number four of the Fatui Harbingers and has the heresy symbol as his constellation. Oh, uh, but you know that whole experiment and blasphemy thing? He's just setting a tree on fire, right? But that causes Kole to wake up in a panic, which suggests a possible Sumeru connection because that's where she is. And seeing as a previous Tender Archon would have been a tree god, given the relationship to Kusanali, which I won't go into right now, and then it's very possible that Dottori is setting a very important tree on fire. Maybe an Irminsul tree, or a tree left behind by the previous Archon when they died. And, uh, you know how you set Dendro Slimes on fire in order to lure them out of the ground? What if that's what Dottori's doing, but with an Archon? We'll come back to this idea a little bit later. Please keep in mind that this is Columbina's only mention and only appearance in-game so far. This teaser is, again, all we have to work with. Well, that and one voice line from Child. Now, I did expect Columbina to have a very young, creepy child model based on that voice line, but this isn't exactly what I was expecting. She is hitting all of the right horror movie notes, like being a little girl and a tiny dose of that insane asylum aesthetic coming from the white straps on her back while she's humming a creepy little tune, and I, I love that. But the fact that Child looks at this kid and thinks, no thanks, I don't want to fight that, it's creepy means that she's going to be deceptively powerful. Who doesn't love an overpowered, creepy little girl trope? She also has wings in her hair, which suits the whole bird motif of this crying dove constellation that I assigned to her in my last Harbinger video, and now I kind of think that she's also supposed to have a songbird theme going on. I have seen suggestions that her hairpiece looks a bit like a seraphim's wings, and while her eyes are kind of sealed or bound like a seraphim's would be, and <laughs> fun fact, that is her singing the creepiest remix of Senora's theme song, and the teaser and the seraphim are supposed to be continuously singing holy, 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 so... Columbina coming out with the creepy angel motifs, too. Like, she's she's doing work. Now, as far as the Comedia goes, Columbina was frequently a lover of Arlecchino or played Cupid to a potential lover characters within the play known as the Ida Morati. However, as a creepy child that looks like she has the emotional range of the twins from The Shining, she feels like she's going to be the exact opposite of the Comedia's Columbina. I guess we'll have to wait and see to say for sure. Anyway, Columbina, a.k.a. Damslet, which is a stupid name, it's not even a word, I'm not going to call her that, is a number three of the Fatui Harbingers, and she is definitely the Crying Dove constellation. Admittedly, I have had the hardest time reconciling Capitano's position, because we barely know anything about this guy. Initially, I suggested he was number ten. But having now seen him and heard what Child has to say about him, I have some new thoughts. Child suggests that Capitano is a marvel on the battlefield, but thinks he must be ranked too low for Capitano to take notice of him. Now, if Capitano was indeed number 10, then being separated by one rank makes this comment feel weird, especially since Child seems to have no qualms about fighting Scaramouche, who he's been assigned to chase, and that little munchkin is ranked 6, so Capitano would need to be ranked higher than Scaramouche, meaning numbers 2 or 4. I am still convinced Dottori is number 4, which means Capitano has to be number 2, which still feels weird to me. Comedia's Capitano is a cowardly braggart, all bark, no bite, which is why I originally was inclined to rank him quite low. But Child says he's the exact opposite of this. Victor even says that he'd prefer working for Capitano over Signora, but never says why. Maybe it's because of prestige and rank? I, I'm not sure. But if I may don my tinfoil hat for a second, there's something super weird about this guy. And it might be because I just finished writing a 5,000 word complete analysis of the Yaksha that I have this idea nibbling away at my brain, but Capitano looks a hell of a lot like the Yaksha statues in Liwa. From the helmet to the lack of face to the armor to the twisted designs all over the front of him, these two are weirdly similar. And uh, that's not all. It's kind of hard to see because it's so dark, but Capitano's hairstyle literally matches that of the Geo Yaksha Minogius perfectly. And the chains that hang just below where his eyes should be, they match up with the markings on Minogius' face. And yes, I know, this is a ridiculous idea, because Minogius should have died around a thousand years ago, not 500, but like, 
I still can't shake this suspicious feeling. On the one hand, being a Yaksha would totally explain his prowess on the battlefield, but on the other hand, Capitano and Menogius don't share voice. Can we just acknowledge the, the amount of symbolism that goes into Genshin Impact? It's just... Despite the long, dreadful dialogue that loves to run in circles, overall, it has a lot of symbolism. That now, looking back, playing the game, you know, from like the start of, especially chapter one, now it makes me want to pay, not pay more attention, but like, scope out the easter eggs within the story this actor so i'm like really torn here and the thing is the only constellation left that i'm not sure about is the crossed nails these are a symbol of passion which originally meant torture you can look it up in etymology it, it, they literally meant the same thing the yaksha were tortured by their comic debts so isn't that a little weirdly coincidental and not to debunk my own theory, but all illuminated beasts do have their beast forms as their constellations, so maybe this doesn't apply? Unless Minogius died, came back, and because he's been resurrected and is now inside of a suit of armor, he has a completely different constellation? I don't really know. I'm confused as you are. I, I really am. I don't know what's going on. It's just really suspicious. I thought I'd share. And yeah. That makes Capitano, a.k.a. the Captain, number two of the Fatui Harbingers with the cross nails for his constellation. Okay, I'm actually going to break this down into two videos because it's, it's a lot of info. But then one, I have a lot, I have a lot, I got to set. So if you haven't already, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And also to stay hydrated. I hope you're having a good afternoon, good morning. And a good night whenever you're watching this. I will be back for part two.